can't go back to the beginning Can't control what tomorrow will bring But I know here in the middle Is the place where you promised to
morning, everybody, and welcome to The Gathering Online. My name is Kristen, and I'm the church administrator at The Gathering, and today is Sunday, September 5th, 2021. Thanks for tuning in on this Labor Day weekend or whenever you're watching this. If you are watching this on Sunday morning, then I hope we'll be seeing you shortly, because right after church today, we are meeting at Four Seasons Park here in Riverside South at noon for a church family picnic and park playtime for the kids. Bring your own picnic lunch and your lawn chairs or blanket and come hang out with us. We'd love, love, love to see you. Of course, if it's raining, we'll have to cancel. So if the skies look dicey, pop over to Facebook and you'll see a note there about whether we're a go or not. Hopefully we're a go. Well, I know this coming week is a big one for a lot of people. We've got a bunch of kiddos going back to school this week, both in person and online. Kids and parents have a great first day of school. Kids do great things. Be a great friend to other kids. Be a great student for your teacher. Work hard this year and learn lots. As we all settle back into our fall routines, we want you to add church in person back into your life. Starting next week, September 12th, we'll be in person every Sunday. We're starting off outdoors, a family service, so no kids programs yet, with live worship and an opportunity for connection that we don't want you to miss. We're outside in the back courtyard at St. FX High School, 1030 on Sunday mornings. Bring your chairs. If you want to bring a shade tent, do that. The weather's starting to cool down, so make sure you dress appropriately. And of course, bring a mask so that if you need to go inside to use the washroom, you'll be able to do that safely. All of that being said, if on one of these Sundays it does rain, we'll just have you set up your chair inside the gymnasium and we'll still be able to meet. Now, I'd like to challenge you all. I know that some of you might be feeling like, you know, this online church thing is working for me. We have an easy morning. I get to watch church in my jammy jammers. The family all tunes in together and you're not wrong. But there's one thing that's missing and it's a really big thing. It's your church community. Online church was a great blessing while we were able, while we were unable to meet in person. But we're back, baby, starting next Sunday. We're in person every week, which means your church community is back and ready to meet with you. Now, that's bright. Now, all of that being said, yes, online church is still happening. If you're not able to come to our in-person services because you're unwell or out of town or for any other reason, we'd still love for you to join us online every Sunday at 1030 a.m. One more quick plug for regathering is that we will soon be needing to regather our volunteers. So if you want to be a part of this thing we call church and be part of creating an environment where people can meet with Jesus, then let me know and we will get you involved in changing people's lives. At the gathering, we exist to connect people to the love of Jesus and we need your help to do that. So reach out to me. Let's chat about volunteering. I know it looks like I'm crying and it's not that I'm just so emotional about volunteering, which I am. I'm very passionate about it, but it's just so bright it's making me cry <laughs> well this morning in a few moments we've got one more brand new kids corner for you so go get the kids ready because it's almost time for them and I want to say thank you to Karen and Stephen they put together a year's worth of kids quarters which was no small feat Karen is a teacher at a local school and on top of that she's volunteered countless hours here with us investing in our kids and we are so very grateful and of course Stephen has been involved in those as well Thank you so much. A shout out too to George and Daniel who've had roles in some of the past kids' corners. The entire Pritilac family has been hugely involved and we're incredibly grateful for all that you have done. All of the kids' corners that they have made are on our YouTube channel. We've got a special kids' corner playlist. So you can put that on for the kids anytime. And like I said, we've got one more brand new one coming up shortly. After that, we've got some worship for you. And then Jeff is going to be here to read some scripture and say a few words because Dan, our awesome church planter, will be here with this morning's message. That's right, y'all have got the whole gathering staff team today. How lucky you are. Before all of that happens, I'm going to give you an opportunity to worship God with your finances and give back a portion of what God has entrusted to you. Tithing is an act of worship, whether you're doing it this morning online or if you've got direct deposit set up. As followers of Jesus, tithing is an act of worship that we are called to do. And then when those funds come in, they're used to help further God's kingdom. If you would like information on how to give or how to set up direct debit or anything along those lines, then go to thegatheringottawa.com giving or send me an email and I can help you out. All right, hopefully it's not raining. It's certainly not right now when I'm filming it. And the kids and I will see you in like an hour at the park. If it is, then we'll definitely see you next week for church. That's rain or shine. Make it part of your weekly routine again. You'll be so glad you did. 
that's it for me. I'm out. I miss you. See you soon. Hello, friends. Today's story is called Elisha Takes Over from Elijah. A long time ago in the land of Israel, there lived two prophets of God, Elijah and Elisha. The two prophets were on their way to Gilgal. Elijah, after many years of faithful service, had been told by God that he was about to be taken up into heaven and was enjoying his last few hours with his friend Elisha. The Lord told me I am to go into heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah explained. A whirlwind, exclaimed Elisha, I will not leave you. Elijah thought about this and decided to test his friend. He said, you stay here at Gilgal and I'll walk on to Bethel. Oh no, said Elisha, I'm coming with you. As the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they walked from Gilgal all the way to another town called Bethel. When they got there, a crowd of young prophets came to meet them. Elisha, they said, the Lord is going to take your master away from you today. I know, said Elisha, please don't talk about it. Then Elijah said, now my friend, you stay here at Bethel while I go on to Jericho. But Elisha wouldn't be put off. I'm coming with you, he said. When they got to Jericho, another crowd of young prophets came to meet them, and they told Elisha the same thing, that Elijah was going to be taken away that very day. I know, said Elisha. Please don't talk about it. Elijah decided to test Elisha a bit more. I'm going to Jordan now, he said. Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you live, I'm not going to leave your side. So away they went, and finally they reached the bank of the Jordan River. They stood beside the river for a while. Elisha looked at the deep flowing water and wondered what Elijah was going to do. Were they going to have to swim across? But Elijah had no worries. He knew what he was about to do. He slipped his cloak off his shoulders. Elijah twirled his cloak into a rope and thumped it down on the water of the river. Immediately, the water sprang back and split into two parts, leaving a nice dry path right across the riverbed. The two men walked across without getting their feet wet. Elijah was satisfied now. He had been testing Elisha to see how keen he was. Three times he had tried to put him off, but Elisha had stuck close by. Elijah now turned to Elisha and said, Tell me, what can I give to you before I die? Elisha knew straight away what he wanted. Give me a double portion of your spirit, he said. Make me your son. Elijah was thrilled at his friend's attitude. If you see me die, he said, then you will be my son. But if not, then I cannot give you what you ask. Suddenly, a mighty wind began to blow, and high in the sky, a chariot and horses appeared. They came nearer and nearer, and now Elisha could see flames coming from the horses, and a fire crackled and burned around the chariot. The wind blew harder and harder, and Elisha gasped as the fearful sight came closer. Eventually, the wind was too fierce, and Elisha staggered away. He was terrified. He shielded his face from the blazing, fiery vision and fell to the ground. The chariot roared even closer and swept between him and Elijah. Then the wind began to whip around Elijah, tugging harder and harder at him. Then, with a final roar, the wind lifted Elijah right off the ground and carried him higher and higher into the sky. Elisha watched as Elijah went up and up 
until Elijah was nothing but a tiny dot. And then he was so far away, he disappeared. Elisha was very sad. There goes my father, he cried. He was like an army to Israel. But now he's gone. But something fell from the sky and landed on the ground. Elisha ran to pick it up. The cloak, he shouted. I really am Elijah's son. The Lord has let him adopt me. Praise God. Elisha was thrilled. Not only was he now Elijah's son, but he was also the new prophet of the Lord. This was a tremendous blessing. He ran and skipped joyfully all the way back to the Jordan River. When he arrived at the river, he rolled up the cloak just as Elijah had done and struck the water with it. Where is the God of Elijah? he shouted. Immediately, the water rolled back and made a dry path from bank to bank. Elisha ran across. The young prophets came to meet Elisha as he walked into Jericho. They already knew about how Elijah had gone up into the sky in the great wind. Where is Elijah, they asked. Let us send 50 strong men to go and look for him. He may have come down somewhere. Don't waste your time, said Elisha. He's gone to heaven. But the young prophets were sure that Elijah must have dropped out of the sky somewhere. So they pestered and pestered Elisha until he finally said, Okay, go and look for him if you must, but don't blame me if you find nothing. Off went the searchers and they looked everywhere. But of course, they didn't find Elijah. You see, when a prophet of the Lord speaks, his words are to be trusted. Don't be like the silly young prophets who went searching for something that wasn't there. Trust what the Bible says and do what Jesus, the Son of God, tells you to do. If you listen to him, you can never go wrong. Here are two verses for this week. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. There's a way back home for the wandering soul. There's a peaceful calm for the restless one. And if you're so far gone, you can't see the shore. But just lift your eyes and look to the Lord. Oh
from the peaceful shore Fall into a hopeless floor Oh, the wreckage of the fall There was no way Then I saw the lighthouse I was Gathering Church family, so good to have you tracking with us on this Sunday morning or whenever it is that you're watching. If we haven't met yet, my name is Jeff and I'm the lead pastor at the gathering. And typically on Sundays, you'll hear from me. I'm the one that usually preaches and brings the message. But this morning, we are hearing from Dan Shook Reed. Dan preaches here from time to time, once a month, once every couple of months or so. Dan is a church planter working with us in the downtown core of Ottawa. And we love Dan and Mel and his boys and all the great things that God is doing through him and his family and uh, this little community of faith that is being birthed there in, uh, in the downtown area of Ottawa. And uh, so excited to hear uh, from Dan and what it is that God has to say to us ultimately through Dan and through his word here today. I also just want to mention that I am so pumped to be together again in person next Sunday. This morning is actually kind of our last online exclusive service. We're going to continue on with online services after this morning, but starting next week, we're going to be together again, hopefully every week, every Sunday morning at St. FX, outdoors till it gets too cold. You heard all the details from Kristen already, but I'm just pumped, excited to be together with all of you again, and I really hope that you'll make it a priority uh, to join us again for worship and for opening the scriptures together, connecting uh, together in community, encouraging one another, worshiping together. It's going to be so good, and I can't wait to launch into this uh, fall season together in person as a church. Hope to see you there next Sunday, 1030 at St. FX. This morning, Dan is uh, preaching from Psalm 85 throughout the summer. We've been looking at different Psalms all summer long. We're in a series called Songs of the Summer. Psalms, of course, being uh, poems, songs, hymns that speak to the goodness and faithfulness of God and how we can experience his goodness even in the midst of some really difficult and challenging circumstances in life. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I've grown a lot, learned a lot of things as I've been kind of reflecting on the Psalms this summer, and I hope that you have too. We've got one more Psalm here today. Dan's bringing it, Psalm 85. Let me read that Psalm for you. It says this, it says, Lord, you poured out blessings on your land. You restored the fortunes of Israel. You forgave the guilt of your people. Yes, you covered all their sins. You hold back their fury. You kept back your blazing anger. Now restore us again, O God of our salvation. Put aside your anger against us once more. Will you be angry with us always? Will you prolong your wrath to all generations? Won't you revive us again so your people can rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I listen carefully to what God the Lord is saying, for he speaks peace to his faithful people. But let them not return to their foolish ways. 
Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, so our land will be filled with his glory. Unfailing love and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth springs up from the earth and righteousness smiles down from heaven. Yes, the Lord pours down his blessings. Our land will yield its bountiful harvest. Righteousness goes as a herald before him, preparing the way for his steps. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray before Dan brings the message this morning. Well, Lord Jesus, we do thank you for your word to us. We thank you that it's as relevant now as it was when it was written and that your spirit longs to bring it to life in our hearts. And so we pray, God, that as we open your word today, as we reflect on Psalm 85, that your spirit would illuminate the truth in the scriptures in our hearts, that you would speak to us, speak to us right where we're at here today, but the different circumstances we're facing in this life, different doubts that we might be having, different challenges that we're facing, would you speak to us through your word here today? Open our hearts, our ears, our eyes to see, to hear what it is that you'd have to say here today. And God, I thank you for every person watching. I know that there are some who are watching who don't yet know you. God, would you, would you speak to them as well? Would you show them your unfailing love? The psalm here speaks about your unfailing love. Would we all, including those who don't know you, see your unfailing love for what it is here today? For those who are watching, who are with, with us here today, who are suffering in some way, who are experiencing uh, some sort of difficulty in life, maybe a, an illness or a challenge, a mental health challenge of some kind, God, we pray that you'd be their peace that you'd be their healer, that you would meet them right where they're at, encourage them, encourage us by your spirit. For those in our community who are grieving losses, maybe the loss of a loved one or even just grieving the fact that someone has been recently diagnosed with something and there's a potential loss coming in the future or uh, just different challenges that they're trying to navigate in their life. God, would you be their comfort and peace as well? We need you, Lord Jesus. We invite you by your spirit to come, to minister to every person watching, to meet every need, to remind us of your love, to point us to Jesus again and remind us of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Remind us of the gospel so that we can walk in faithfulness to you, not by our strength alone, but by your spirit. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, can't wait to see you, hopefully, in person next week. Uh, For now, Dan, thanks for bringing the message. Can't wait to hear what it is that God has to say through you and through the word here today as we open the Bible together. God bless you, everyone. See you soon. Good morning, The Gathering. I am so grateful to have this opportunity to be with you. Um, Happy Labor Day weekend, and I'm uh, sad that we're not together in person, but it is really a blessing to to get to speak to you, and uh, I miss you all a lot. Hopefully we can connect again soon, and I'm so grateful for the way that you've walked with me and with my family, and uh, it's great to be a part of this community and a part of this church. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was in a circle and a woman said this statement, I don't think I can go through another lockdown. We were in a circle in the park and we were engaging in the spiritual practice of lament. We were laying down our fears, our pains and our insecurities to God and honestly confessing where life has been difficult, our need for healing and pleading for God to remind us of his presence. Now this woman, she lives alone and she's a young professional in her 30s and in many ways she's confident independent successful but the pandemic has been really wearing on her and she fears that she's going to fall apart burn out you know the loneliness the fear the isolation all of us were wired for community and connection and the pandemic for so many has been challenging as so as we sat and we confessed how we're truly doing I was struck by the the difficulties that so many are going through. You know, I pastor a pretty young congregation 
uh, church plant in the downtown. And I am really shocked by the number of people who are going through significant health challenges, whether that's physical or mental. In my mind, people in their 20s and early 30s, you know, they shouldn't be making doctor's appointments to find out if they have MS or cancer or something else. You know, a 20-something-year-old guy that I know is sitting with his dad who's in palliative care, uncertain when he's going to pass away. I was probably blissfully ignorant as a teen and young adult, but the challenges that people are going through right now just continue to amaze me. And watching the news does not help my mental health. You know, the stories of pain and suffering around the world, it can feel really overwhelming, whether that's wildfires and drought, natural disasters. I'm finding election coverage is making me pretty cynical. I'm a big advocate for affordable housing. And I just wonder if we'll ever be able to tr help the most vulnerable, like people that need the deeply affordable uh, housing. And I've found the news about Afghanistan and the events that are happening there particularly challenging. And it feels like I can lose hope. So I find that the pain in our world causes me to cry out to God and ask him a lot of questions about why these hardships are taking place. Like, God, are you at work in the world? Are you really good? Can I trust you? Like, really trust you? Do you truly care about people, even the ones that seem to go through so much suffering? And many of us, I think, have asked God these questions. Are you truly merciful? Are you really loving? And do his actions reflect a God that's filled with compassion, kindness, and grace? And at times, God can feel distant or angry. It's hard to know if he truly sees us or the people we love. Is he fighting for us? Is God's path for my life truly the best one? Will God take all the broken pieces and somehow mend them together and make them beautiful? And then at the same time, you know, I also wonder, is God truly just? Does it really matter when I do things my own way? You know, does he care about some of those, you know, in our eyes, small sins? You know, does he care if I steal a chocolate bar? Um, is he even paying attention? Are there sins that just don't really actually affect other people? Or can my sins be justified? Because at least I'm not as bad as that guy. And... You know, not necessarily only in my own life, but is God truly just in terms of the whole world? Like, is he really fighting for the widow, the orphan, the sick, the rejected? Does it actually matter if my company is above reproach in their ethics? And does anyone really care if we take advantage of people that are invisible or unseen? Will God really one day elevate the humble and bring down the powerful? Will the hungry truly one day get fed and the naked be clothed? Is God just? Is he loving? Well, today I want to share a psalm with you that I think provides a lot of hope. And Psalm 85 is titled in my Bible as a prayer for restoration of God's favor. And the speaker is honest and clear with God about the pain and the suffering they see in their people, in their land, and in their world. And they implore to God to respond and they cry out to him. As we look at this psalm today, I want to invite you to take the risk to consider where you are yourself discouraged, feeling broken, wounded, or despondent. And collectively, it's my hope that we can bring those things to God and allow the psalm to teach us what it looks like to have a hope for restoration and revival. This vision of the kingdom will remind us again of God's promise that is both full of compassion and love as well as being righteous. It's my hope today that God lifts up your gaze and he allows you to see what is true beyond the scope of your own limited perception. May he encourage us and fill us anew with imagination and joy. So the Psalm 85 begins verses one to three with a call to remember. The writer remembers how God was once favorable to the land. The Israelite people had known what it was like to experience the favor of God and to see their boundaries expanded, to see their kingdom at peace. The people have experienced God forgive their sins and they know what it 
feels like to be at peace with their maker. If you are praying this song in your own life, what are your memories that show God's favor? Your memories that show God's faithfulness? Was there a time he provided for you financially? A time that he cared for you through a friend? Maybe you um, have a time where you remember him helping take away an experience of shame or guilt. Or maybe there was a time that was particularly difficult where you could tangibly feel God's presence. And if you are a follower of Jesus, what was it like when you came to believe in him? Did you have some kind of experience that helped, uh, helped you in your faith? that kind of helped you know that Jesus was real and that he was there? What was that like? Well, when we remember, I think we tell stories. And so if I were to tell Psalm 85, one to three, I think it could sound a little bit like this. Father God, you have always been so good to me. You invited me to follow you. And you invited me to leave my parents' home, my hometown, and everything that was familiar to follow you. And in the process, everything was stripped away. And I realized how desperate I was and how much I needed you. I was scared, ashamed, and insecure. And you forgave my sins and gave me a new identity as your child. But not only that, when life got really hard and I got diagnosed with cancer, and I lost the church that I loved. You were faithful to provide. You provided a community um, and friends that loved me like family. You continued to provide for me financially and gave me meaningful work. And you brought healing to my body, but more importantly, to my soul. God, you have always been so, so good to me. So what stories would you tell? How has God been good to you? How is he present? Well, though the Israelites have a history of rebellion and idolatry, they have stories of God's mercy being extended and experiencing his forgiveness. God has shown himself to be a God who restores. And restoration is bringing something back to its previous condition. The author's tone um, changes in verses four to seven. He no longer remembers just the past, but he begins to say a prayer for restoration. Restore us again, O oh God of our salvation. The speaker begins to call out to God to demonstrate his character of steadfast love and salvation once again to his people. He knows that these traits are who God is. He cannot stop loving us. He is mighty to save and rescue us from our sin, our destruction, and the rebellion that we are living in. And it is he who is faithful and unchanging. The people's current experience of God is that they feel like he is angry with them. Did the people see God only as angry and forget about his other characteristics? Well, in this lament, the author is crying out on behalf of his people and speaking truthfully about what they feel. And in their view, God in that moment is just angry. And that is the basis for this prayer. Scholars note that this psalm may have actually been written in the context of the Israelites' exile to Babylon. They've lost everything they know, and it's because they did not abide by God's law. They feel distant from him and from his favor. They're uh, experiencing the full consequences of their rebellion and their sin, and they're longing to return to their land, to experience the freedom to worship, and to be a nation and a people once again. And in the midst of the loss and the brokenness, they begin to lament and mourn because the great brokenness that they see in the world They know that their own sin has contributed to the destruction and the pain that they and others are experiencing. So from this present experience of feeling like God is angry and experiencing his judgment, the writer prays for revival. He asks that God's salvation may return to the people. He prays that they would experience the glory of God, his presence once more in the land. And revival is an important, is an improvement in the condition or the strength of something. It involves a fresh understanding of God's grace and his loving character. When revival happens, we are filled anew with the understanding of God's goodness and his presence and how he is active in the world. We're reminded that God is powerful and that he can work miracles in our midst. So what would a prayer for revival or restoration look like? 
Well, this past season has been so hard for so many of us. If you were honest with God, what would you have to say? Maybe your prayer would look something like this. God, please restore my marriage. It feels like it's falling apart. God, please be with my daughter. I don't know how to support her. It feels like all we do is fight. Her depression has made her just a shell of herself. If I were to pray, maybe my prayer would look a little bit like this. Sweet Jesus, please restore us again. I feel so tired. Please help the kids stay in school this year. I don't think we can do another season of trying to navigate online schooling and working from home. Please provide more ideas and opportunities to get support for our kids, and we can't keep trying to help them with their schooling and work at the same time. Please limit hospitalizations and deaths from this fourth wave of COVID. Please help our city continue to function and our systems and structures to be restored. Help our faith communities to continue to find ways to gather safely and help people find community. God, please help our churches to stay unified in a season where there's so much polarization. God, please restore our joy. This year has been so hard. Would you help me experience your love anew and afresh and would you rescue me? I know that there are ways that I have coped during the past year that are symptoms of brokenness deeper within my heart. I need spiritual renewal and revival in my own life, Father God. I love how, in my own opinion, this psalm is just clear as his chest. And I think that this point is massive for us today. We need to know that God is giving us permission to express to him what we truly feel, all our pains, all our doubts, all of our questions, all of the ways that we cannot see how he is present or active in our lives or in the world. And I also think it's important to note that the writer doesn't sugarcoat what he's going through. He does not intercept his prayer with a speech about how God is still somehow faithful and good. He does not feel pressure to praise even though his heart's not into it. He just simply speaks what he's speaking, what he's feeling. And after laying down, honestly, the pain and the hardships of his people to God, the psalmist stops in verse eight, and he does something that I think is so countercultural to us. He switches from speaking in the plural on behalf of all of his people, and he speaks in the singular, and he stops and he listens. Let me hear what the Lord will speak. And when you think of your own life, after you're honest with God about how sucky you think your own life or the world can be, what do you usually do? Is it your natural response to then turn to God and invite him to speak? I know that in my own life, I am often not that holy. <laughs> Too often in my pride, I begin to make a list of demands on how God should respond. I paint a picture of what justice, in my opinion, looks like, and essentially I prescribe that God do things my own way. I'm afraid that often I'm tempted to put myself in the position of the all-knowing, just, and wise God, and I treat God a little bit like my little errand boy. Well, I love the humility and the posture of the speaker. After his confession and his lament before God, he chooses humility and silence. He chooses to allow God to reveal himself rather than dictate what salvation and restoration looks like. And he allows himself to be the clay and he allows himself, uh, he allows God to be the creator. Not only that, but the tone of the text completely shifts in this verse. I believe verse eight acts a bit like a hinge for all of the Psalm 85. And if you have it in front of, it, of you, feel free to look at it with me. Verses one to three are about remembering. God was full of mercy and grace in the past, but there's a mention of God's hot anger. And then verses four to seven are this prayer and confession. God, will you be angry with us forever? Will your people rejoice again? Will we ever know your love or salvation? However, once the song or the psalmist chooses a posture of listening, Hope, it just begins to spill off the page. You will speak peace to your people. Remember, 
Peace here is not just about quieting of the mind or a lack of negative feelings, but peace is so much more. It's the Hebrew word shalom. It's the idea of wholeness, of restoration, things that are broken being set right. That includes neighbors or relationships with neighbors, relationship with God, but even peace with yourself, freedom from shame and guilt, peace with your present, with your future, a calming of anxiety, a dispelling of fear, Shalom includes all of these things. The psalmist is hopeful that God will once again dwell among the people in the land. He's hopeful that they'll experience his Shekinah glory, that the power and the glory of the Lord will once again be known. And not only that, but he's post- this posture of listening births a beautiful vision of the kingdom of God. And I have to admit that verses 10 to 13 are some of the most powerful and inspiring verses, I think, in scripture. They provoke our imagination. They contain a vibrant picture of what God is doing and what he will do in the world. And when you're asked to describe God, what attributes usually come to mind? Would you say that there's a theme or a trend in those attributes? Are a lot of the things that you think about um, kind of line up with a God who's merciful, God that's compassionate? When you think of God, do you think of someone who's distant, angry? Do you think of a judge who wants to deal with sin and bring about righteousness? Do you kind of think of a mix of these things? Well, I don't know about you, but I find that when most people describe God, they often wrestle with holding the fact that God is both merciful and just, that he's both truth and love, as I kind of alluded to in the intro. And it's hard to live in the tension between these characteristics and not treat them like opposites that are kind of at war with one another. Can someone truly be just and still be merciful? Is truth compromised in order to show someone compassion. Are these two virtues able to coexist without watering down the other? Well, sit back and listen. As I think the speaker of this psalm reveals a beautiful picture of God's reconciliation that both marries these two virtues in a compelling, hopeful, and I think awe-inspiring way. He begins, love and faithfulness will meet. And one commentator writes that faithfulness here kind of encapsulates an idea of truth. It's like saying that love and truth shall meet. Love and truth do not need to be opposites, but are partnered in the work of God's kingdom coming to earth. And the writer continues that righteousness and peace will kiss each other. And dude, that's some beautiful poetry. Righteousness is the work of putting things right and in their rightful place and is often related to justice. God will restore and renew this broken world. He will address all evil, destruction, chaos, disorder, and he will reorder, recreate, and he will finally deal with all the sin. But this picture of righteousness is matched with peace. God will bring about his justice alongside bringing wholeness and peace to the earth. And I just think it's beautiful. When he deals with the sin, He's not just simply wiping out evil, but he's also bringing wholeness to the earth. And in God and in his kingdom, we see judgment and peace connected. We see righteousness and wholeness interwoven. And it is unlike any peace mission or judge's verdict that we've ever seen in the kingdom of this world. Only God can truly set up the world how it's supposed to be and help all of humanity and our beautiful earth flourish and thrive. Faithfulness springs up from the ground while righteousness looks down from the sky. Heaven and earth will meet in this beautiful vision of the kingdom. God will give all of those who turn from their self-will and confess their need and desire to be his children all that is good. So what does God's restoration look like? Well, concretely, the text says that our land will be restored, that it will be plentiful. The pain that we see all around the world, the sickness, the natural disasters, the forest fires, the drought, all of the consequences of our sin and a rebellion um, towards God will be gone. Uh, The earth we know is groaning in pain because of our broken relationship with God and creation. We're pillaging our planet. We're abusing our sacred roles as God's stewards of the earth. And in response, the earth is crying out and we can see the damaging effects of our sin on the planet. But there's hope. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let 
the forest sing for joy, says Psalm 96. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he has come to judge the earth, says Psalm 98. God will come, and one day he will make all things new, and he will come and restore creation and set things right. When God restores the earth, the planet will once again function like it was always meant to. This speaker here, I think, is alluding to this beautiful picture of the restoration of Eden and the coming of the new heaven and the new earth. And this psalm is some of our earliest literature that then shapes and forms our future ideas about the heaven and the promise of the new earth that Jesus gave us. There's echoes of it in Isaiah's text when he talks about how the wolf and the lamb shall feed together and that the lion shall eat straw. When in Peter's writing, when he says, but in accordance with this promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth while righteousness is at home. And this text also helps us interpret John's famous vision in Revelation. I love this text in Revelation 21, three to four, where he says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his people and God himself will be with them. And then get this, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be more, no more. For the first things shall pass away. Heaven is coming to earth. God will establish his kingdom here in our midst and he will renew and restore all of the brokenness in our world and he will take away all of our pain. He will not only be present with us in our sadness and in our struggles, but he will wipe away our tears and we will finally one day be free from all of the consequences of our rebellion of our, and of our sin and our beautiful world will be restored. That is our hope. That is what God has promised that he will do. And he has said that he is coming and he will bring justice that will fully know his steadfast love for us that's unwavering and everlasting. And I find this so encouraging because I don't think the original psalmist realized the power of his words. He comes to God crying out on behalf of his nation because of their suffering and their agony and asking God to restore just the kingdom of Israel. But God's plan, his vision is way bigger. God does not stop with just restoring one people. No, his restoration and his renewal is a rescue plan for the entire world. And ultimately from our seat in the story, we know that how God does this is through Christ. Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of this picture of the kingdom that the speaker receives. He's love and truth in one person, never sacrificing one for the other, always responding beautifully to people where he's motivated by both compassion and a desire for people to be in right relationship with God and one another. Jesus is the fulfillment of justice and peace. He judges the proud, he lifts up the lowly, he elevates the sick and comforts the weary. And it's not like he's doing it within some kind of earthly framework or social justice platform that we understand, but he's just driven by compassion and love. And it gives us a sense of the true kingdom of God in Jesus. When people are experiencing the fruits of his justice and his righteousness, they are made whole. Jesus is actively working in a manner to restore people to a right relationship with God, with one another and with the planet. And his mercy is unparalleled because he's able to beautifully restore people's identity as children who are loved by God and know that they have a place in his kingdom and in his family. In Jesus, we see heaven and earth meet and the world will never be the same. He's gone before us and now we have a hope in him. And we trust that one day he will truly come and make all things new and restore this world to how it's meant to be. We trust that one day we will see the fullness of God's righteousness and justice displayed throughout the world. We'll finally see an end to sin and death and Satan will finally be defeated. We trust that we will one day be amazed by the extent of God's grace and his mercy as we see countless individuals and families saved from the wrath that they deserve and given a seat at a table in the kingdom of God. Our hope is in the fact that God really can take the mess of this world and somehow redeem it 
and restore it for the sake of his glory. So as I conclude, I hope that this song can be an encouragement to you. I hope that it can help you pray as you feel weighed down by the pain of the world. So we begin by remembering. When we pray, we recount to God how he's been faithful to us in the past. What has God said to you about himself? How has he shown himself to be faithful? What's his track record in your life? How has he provided for you in the past? And then when we have needs, we learn how to honestly confess them. Remember, the psalmist also does not just do this individualistically, but he does it communally. We learn, need to learn how to pray with a bigger lens. Bring before God the pain also in your family, in your church, in your city, and even your whole nation. Even in the times where things are going well for you, do not forget to bring forward the needs of the larger community that you're a part of. And then thirdly, after we've prayed, we silence ourselves. We learn to wait on God. We ask him to speak. We ask him to reveal how he is present in the current situation that we're in. And we ask him to re remind us of who he is and how he's promised that he will respond. And then as we wait, it is my hope that we will review, that God will give us a vision of who he is, how he is at work, and how he is ushering in his kingdom in our midst. And it's like, I believe that God wants to give us a new set of glasses so that we can see what is ultimately true and real. It's like God pulls back the curtain and reframes for us how we can see the world. My hope is that we will be a people who are able to pray with faith and with passion, believing that God is truly who he is, says he is, and that he truly is at work establishing and building his kingdom in our midst. Jesus is coming back, friends. Will you be ready? Are you an active participant now in partnering with God in the work that he is doing? I wanna conclude by praying. Father God, we thank you for this time together today. I thank you that in Christ and through the power of his death and his resurrection, we have hope that you truly are repairing and restoring and renewing our broken world. That you are um, gathering all things in Christ and making them new. God, we come to you today and we want to pray in the format of this song. God, as we start, I want to invite people to remember. Remember how you've been faithful. Remember how you've provided. Remember how you have encouraged us in the past and helped us to believe that you truly are there, truly at work, that you may, that you may exist. Be near to people, God. Help them to remember your faithfulness. God, I pray that people would be honest. Right now, as you're sitting here, I want you to offer to God what's hard. Maybe it's in your life, a friend's life, in our city, in our country, in the world. Offer to God what's on your heart, what's been weighing you down. Talk to him about it. Be honest. How does it make you feel? And do you feel his presence? Does he feel like he's there? Does he seem angry with you? Be honest with God. And God, we do want to take time to listen. We want you to speak to us. We want you to remind us of who you are. We want you to remind us of how you're at work. Settle and quiet your heart. Say, take some time to listen to God. God, it is my prayer that you speak to people, that they get a sense of a reminder of your presence, of your power, and how you are restoring all things. Jesus, I thank you that my hope is in you. My hope is not in myself, my ability to fix my own issues, because I would be in trouble. My ability to help my friends, or my family. God, I thank you that you are our savior, our rescuer, and that you are mighty to save. Establish your kingdom in our midst. Would you help us to be ready? And I pray that you would help us to be your partners in mission. And would you give us a vision of what's really true 
and who you are and the power of your kingdom at work. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Friends, it was so good to be with you today. Thanks for hanging in and uh, watching this whole message. And uh, I hope to be with you in person soon. Um, I am so thankful for you. And uh, may God be with you and enjoy the rest of your holiday weekend. All right, blessings. Bye. There's a way back home for the wandering soul. There's a peaceful calm for the restless one. And if you're so far gone, you can't see the shore. But just lift your eyes and look to the Lord. Hope that you need